This is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church. But it's also the Sunday when we recognize and appreciate those faithful folks who've been church members for 50 or more years. And you see that list of names in the bulletin, starting with our longest tenured member, Mary Davison. Mary Davison joined First Congregational way back in 1936. That's 83 years ago. Wow, so congratulations. I wonder, are you here, Mary? No, Mary is not here today. She lives in Turning Brook, so if you want to go visit Mary Davison, just visit her at Turning Brook. My mom and dad, Dodie and Les Lance, joined this church in January of 1966. That was 53 years ago, a few months after our family moved here from Cadillac, which was Dodie's hometown. That puts them in the cohort with Blair Diamond, with Mary Minnick, with Dave Zeller. It also makes me realize that Edith Gerber and Jim McNeil and Andy Cruz and I, we sh should have been added to this list this year if we hadn't lived elsewhere for 30 or 40 years. <laughs> for me, this anniversary brings to mind confirmation class with Reverend Barksdale and then Pilgrim Fellowship with Mrs. B. How many of you, like me, remember Reverend Barksdale and Madge? Uh, I thought he looked a lot like President Johnson, and with his slightly southern drawl, he even sounded a bit like LBJ. Reverend Barksdale was at the helm 64 years ago when this sanctuary was built. We give a lot of credit to Jesse and Anna Besser, faithful members of this congregation, first for creating the Besser block machines that produced all the concrete masonry used in constructing this church. And second, for generously underwriting the enormous expense of building it. Jim McNeil was told that his was the first baptism in this new church building. Now that dates us, doesn't it, Jim? <laughs> How many of you remember Jesse Besser? How many of you remember the old brick church that formerly stood at this place? Look at that, lots of folk. Going back a bit earlier in time, Jerry Standen says that he was baptized by a German minister here at First Congregational, the Reverend Albert Kaufmann, who served as the minister prior to the Barksdales from 1942 to 1947. Those were during the war years. Were any of you here with Reverend Kaufman? Yeah, yeah, he was a baby, but uh, he was here. Imagine, the minister here in Alpena at this church during World War II was a German who, according to Jerry, supported the Nazis. Enough said about that. There may be only a few of you who remember even earlier the Reverend Clayton Stowe, who served here from 1939 to 42. That's the man who would have been the minister of our church when Mary Davison became a member. Reverend Stowe left Alpena in order to serve as a chaplain in the Second World War. May I have a show of hands if any of you knew Reverend Stowe? My family and I knew Reverend Stowe at First Congregational Church in Cadillac, which is the church that he served when he came back from the war. And that's the church where my grandma was the organist and where I sang in the junior choir and where I received my fourth grade Bible signed by Reverend Stowe and by my dad, who was the church school superintendent. See, the past is still alive in the stories that we tell in the memories and in the remembrances that we have. Events from the past have greatly influenced who we have become over time. We talked about that at length last Sunday, about in our minds how we give meaning to certain events and it later informs our view of the world. There's a reason I still carry my dad's gift to me, the Bible at my desk. A case could be made that people's lives are mostly an accumulation of events and experiences from the past which have shaped us. 
influencing our thinking, our values, our emotions along the way. Sometimes it's consciously, but most often it's unconscious. The accumulated weight of the past, for good or for ill, 68 years of marriage in that bouquet for this couple right here. For good or for ill, it, it burdens and resources our present life with remembered meanings, remembered messages, familiar patterns. In our call to worship this morning, we recognized with gratitude those faithful church members who are here today, but also those who have gone before us. In good times and in bad, in times of war and in times of peace, in periods of comfortable wealth and depression era poverty. We've been there, First Church, all the way back to our founding in 1862, just as America entered a period of civil war. We were the first church organized up north in Alpena during the lumbering era. And I think of that history when I look up at all the beautiful Northwoods lumber overhead. However, in fact, our church roots are much deeper than that. We stretch in unbroken line all the way back to that first Pentecost Sunday some 2,000 years ago. Pentecost, the birthday of the church. The day that the Holy Spirit unexpectedly entered the upper room with a rush of a mighty wind and tongues like fire and filled the followers of Jesus who were gathered there. Pentecost was the day that got the church up, revved up and running, so to speak. The day of Pentecost comes 50 days after Passover, or as we in the church say, 50 days after Easter. The disciples and the other followers of Jesus had been hiding out for those 50 days days. They were not sure what they should do or where they should go or who they could trust. It had been, after all, only less than two months since Jesus had been arrested by the Jewish authorities and then executed by the Romans on a cross like a criminal. And they were just barely hanging on. They were hanging out together. They were hanging in there as best they could. Together they were waiting. They were just waiting in Jerusalem, waiting was in fact what Jesus had told them to do. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Luke 24, 49. Some of his last words to his disciples. Now, now they didn't know what it actually meant. They didn't know who or what the Holy Spirit was, but they knew they weren't supposed to head for home until the time was right. Easter, as I said, was already seven weeks behind them. Jesus had ascended into heaven and had left them behind. The amazing experiences that they had had of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, they were powerful, memorable, but they're all now in kind of the rear view mirror. Retrospective, like our memories of the Barksdales or, or, or the Bessers or Jack Fitzgerald. It, it's, it's rear view mirror. The new challenge for them back then and the challenge for us in our day is how do you keep the momentum of Jesus' movement and ministry going? How do you take those rich personal experiences from the past and project them into the future for God's sake, in Jesus' name? So that when I share a Bible with the kids, they'll figure out it has something to do with something instead of nothing to do with anything. So should they start doing Bible studies, these early disciples? Should they, should they start a school and call disciples of their own like Jesus did? Should they come up with some theological doctrines that they insist everybody believe? Or should they just start telling the story? Telling the stories of Jesus. But if they did that, who would listen to them? This common lot of up north Galileans. Moreover, who would believe it? And who would even care? I hope some of you saw the big blue banner I put up on the church, right over here, on the outside exterior wall. It says, be you, be bold, be the church. That's what I think happened at Pentecost. Jesus returned in a powerful way as the Holy Spirit returned and filled each and every one of them 
rekindling in them his memory, rekindling in them his confidence, rekindling in them the movement that he was part of, that they were part of, that they had let stall out. The Holy Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, filled them in order to get them up and get them out and get them going again as a renewed, re-energized, reformed body of Christ in the world. And now Jesus could be anywhere that they went, anywhere they told the story, Jesus was there. As I said in a sermon a few months ago, the Holy Spirit is God's way to make sure that Jesus Christ is always with us. In today's text, the story of the Pentecost event, which took place in Jerusalem 50 days after Easter, that memorable occasion when the Holy Spirit blew through the gathered disciples with the sound of a mighty wind, with light and heat, tongues of flame dividing, separating on them, kind of like in our banner over there. Peter went out and spoke to the amazed, the perplexed crowd which had gathered on the street outside. And he said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And isn't that what's been going on forever after? from one generation to the next, from parents to their daughters and to their sons, to their grandsons and their great-granddaughters, young men see visions of what's possible and old men dream dreams. Now, dreams are more than mere fantasy. Even though there are often some fantastic elements in our dreams, as time and space gets all mixed up 